Good evening everyone. Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy for the day 23rd of March 2023. Displayed here are the list of news articles we will be going through today. Now let's start our discussion. Let us start today's discussion with this editorial article. This editorial article talks about the changing geopolitics in West Asia. After the discovery of oil in the Middle East, the oil production from the Middle East increased. Since then, Middle East has become a battleground for major powers. Particularly, this happened during the Cold War era. At that time, the priority for US was to counter the influence of Soviet Union everywhere. In 1980, the President of United States, Jimmy Carter said, any attempt by any outside force to gain control of the Persian Gulf will be considered a threat to vital interest of the United States of America and such an assault will be repelled by any means necessary including military force. This simply means that the United States would use military force if necessary to defend its national interest in the Persian Gulf. These words by President Jimmy Carter came to be known as the Carter Doctrine and this shaped the policy of the United States in West Asia in the next few decades. The author of this article discusses how this policy has changed over time and what is the current geopolitical situation in West Asia. In this discussion, we will discuss on these aspects more elaborately. Before getting into the discussion, I have highlighted the syllabus regarding this discussion. You can go through it. Let us start by looking at the mistakes committed by the United States in West Asia. For that, we must first understand the geopolitics of the region. The major actors in this play are Saudi Arabia, Iran, Turkey, Israel, United States and Russia. Each actor has different objectives. Iran and Saudi Arabia are rivals. This is because of religious differences. Iran has largely Shia Muslim population while Saudi Arabia sees itself as a leading Sunni Muslim power. Therefore, Iran and Saudi Arabia seek to balance each other out. Russia and USA are seeking to protect its influence in the region. Other actors in the region are either allies of United States or allies of Russia. So, we can say that the war and violence in the region are basically either proxy wars or religious conflicts. Now, the United States had intervened in various situations to exert its influence in the region in the past. But many such attempts have failed. Now, let us see some of the failed attempts or the mistakes committed by the US in the West Asia region or the Middle East region. Firstly, the author talks about the Iraq War of 2003. It began with the invasion of Iraq by the United States-led coalition and it led to the overthrowing of the Iraqi government of Saddam Hussein. The US indulged in the war saying claims that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction program and therefore it is posing a threat to United States and its allies. Additionally, some US officials accused Saddam of supporting Al-Qaeda. However, in 2004, the 9-11 Commission concluded that there was no evidence of any relationship between Saddam's regime and Al-Qaeda. But as a side effect of that war, Al-Qaeda started to penetrate Iraq and later Al-Qaeda transformed itself into Islamic State. And we all know about Islamic State, right? It is a terrorist outfit. See, the US invasion of Iraq destabilized the region. So, the rationale for war faced major criticism for US even from its allies. See, we all know Saudi Arabia is a ally of United States and Saudi Arabia was very unhappy about the US invasion of Iraq. If you can see this map, you can see that Iraq was acting as a buffer state between Saudi Arabia and Iran. But because of the war, Iran and Iraq started developing close relationship. This made Saudi Arabia worryful. So, Saudi Arabia was unpleasant about the stunt of US in the Iraq region. This is the first major mistake committed by United States in Middle East in recent past. Secondly, the author talks about the Syrian war. In 2011, Syrian government was led by President Bashar al-Assad. He faced a challenge to his authority because of pro-democracy protest in the country. The Syrian government was supported by Iran and Russia. The other actors in the play thought that this was a wonderful opportunity to contain Iran. US interfered as expected and supported the pro-democratic protesters. 
but due to its unsuccessful stunt in the recent times us felt cautious so the united states was not ready for another full scale military intervention in short the united states did not make any full fledged entry into the syrian civil war but russia and iran used the opportunity very well and they supported the pro bashir al assad militants so eventually in the end the regime of president bashir al assad survived and the pro democratic protesters which was supported by us and its allies failed to meet its objectives and this stunt by the united states in the syrian war also made other players in the region like saudi and turkey who are allies of united states very unhappy this is the second major mistake committed by united states in the middle east region then during the obama period a nuclear deal was signed with iran see the nuclear deal signing of iran and united states made both countries come little bit closer and this worried saudi arabia which was a rival of iran and later during the trump administration this nuclear deal was broken trump tried to put a lot of pressure on iran iran responded with maximum resistance particularly it targeted saudi arabia and united arab emirates but us did not come for help so this also made the regional players lose their trust on the united states and moreover united states is also becoming more aware of its limitations and therefore it wants to try a new arrangement for the region us is trying to bring its arab allies and israel closer and if that happens israel can take a larger security role against iran in the region basically it is trying to replace itself with israel in the region but this cannot happen due to three reasons firstly us is losing its grip in the region so the regional players are now playing freely and they are making their own foreign policy decisions secondly not all countries in the region are ready to cooperate with israel because of the continuing palestinian issue and thirdly israel itself is resisting the us influence for instance recently the west and its allies tried to impose a sanction on russia but israel did not impose sanctions on russia despite the pressure placed on it by united states and its allies so due to these reasons the united states could not continue to influence the region as it did before and all the allies of united states are trying to find a stable partner within the region itself and they are trying to create their own sphere of influence in the region and besides this a new player has emerged in the region which is china so recently also through a informal summit china tried to mediate between saudi arabia and iran this shows that the influence of united states in middle east has taken a dip in recent years and china is trying to replace us as a security provider in the middle east so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw the mistakes committed by united states in its foreign policy regarding the middle east we also saw why united states plan of replacing itself with israel to contain iran in the middle east will not succeed and finally we saw how china is replacing united states as a security provider and foreign policy provider in the middle east so with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article have a look at this editorial article recently a supreme court bench headed by chief justice of india has reopened a decades old debate on humane and dignified way of executing the death penalty last tuesday the supreme court heard a public interest litigation that was filed by an advocate named rishi malhotra in 2017 the pal challenged the constitutional validity of section 354 subsection 5 of the code of criminal procedure 1973 this particular provision of crpc says that when a person is sentenced to death the sentence shall direct that he be hanged by neck till he is dead in simple words if a person is sentenced to death then he will be hanged until he is dead the petitioner rishi malhotra argued that this particular provision compels the convict to suffer the pain of hanging while executing the death sentence so the petitioner is seeking a more dignified way of executing the death penalty while responding to the petition the supreme court said that it may consider setting up a committee of experts 
This is to examine whether the execution of death penalty convicts by hanging was proportionate and less painful. This is the background about the editorial article. So in our discussion today, we will understand the stand of both judiciary and the executive in regards to death penalty. The judiciary and the executive are backing both the idea of death penalty and the practice of hanging. Now focusing on the stand of the judiciary. There are two main judgments of the Supreme Court in the issue of death penalty. The first judgment was given in the case of Bachchan Singh versus State of Punjab 1980 case. This judgment upheld death penalty, but the Supreme Court limited the death penalty to the rarest of the rare cases. The second judgment was given in the case of Deen Dayal versus Union of India and others 1983 case. In this judgment, the Supreme Court upheld the method of executing death penalty. The Supreme Court in this judgment ruled that the hanging should be as painless as possible and the hanging should not cause greater pain than any other known methods of death penalty. See, in both these cases, the Supreme Court has not favoured the abolition of death penalty, but the Supreme Court has developed a robust and a more humane jurisprudence where it restricted the use of death penalty to the rarest of the rare cases. So, this has made it difficult for the executive to carry out death sentences. This is all about the stand of the Supreme Court on death penalty and mode of executing the death penalty. Now coming to the report of the Law Commission. The 35th report of Law Commission of 1967 has noted that electrocution, use of gas chamber and lethal injection are considered to be less painful compared to hanging. But the Law Commission has said that it was not in a position to come to a conclusion. So, the Law Commission refrained from making any recommendation for the change of the method of executing death penalty. This is about the position of the Law Commission. Now, let us see the stand taken by the Union Government. The Union Government argues that hanging should be retained. The Government says that hanging is not cruel or inhumane. This is because there is a well-established procedure to execute hanging. Overall, both the government and the judiciary are backing the idea of death penalty and the practice of hanging. As we saw earlier, the Supreme Court recently said it may consider setting up a committee of experts to examine the execution of death penalty convicts by hanging. So, all we have to do is wait and see what is going to happen in the future. So, that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw the stand of the judiciary, the law commission and the union executive in regards to death penalty and death by hanging. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this article here. This article talks about tuberculosis. Tuberculosis was declared as a global health emergency in 1993 by the World Health Organization. This is mainly due to its prevalence among the developing countries and its impacts on HIV patients. Currently, the goal is to eradicate tuberculosis by 2030. But the issue here is, there is no clarity on the definitions of end and methods of verification. So in this news article discussion, let us understand the global efforts to combat TB and we shall also see some of the important points mentioned in this article. Before getting into the discussion, I have highlighted the syllabus regarding this discussion. You can go through it. Let us start by looking at the initiatives taken by the global community to combat TB. The first such initiative is the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria. The Global Fund is an international financing and partnership organization. It was created in 2000 and its secretariat is located in Geneva, Switzerland. The Global Fund aims to attract leverage and invest additional resources to end the epidemic of AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. It also aims to support attainment of sustainable development goals. It is designed to promote innovative solution to global health challenges. It works in partnership with governments, civil societies, technical agencies and people affected by the disease. India joined the Global Fund as a donor in 2006. And India, by joining the fund, has contributed a total of $46.5 million up to date. Today, the Global Fund is the main source of new funding for the fight against TB worldwide. However, it remains a victim of zero-sum games imposed on it by the donor constituents. Zero-sum game is nothing but the condition in which someone's fund contribution is immediately dispersed for the purpose for which it is actually constituted. As a result, 
the net change in wealth of the fund will be zero this is the first initiative now moving on to the second initiative the second initiative is the stop tb partnership it was established in 2001 and it's mandated to eliminate tuberculosis as a public health problem the organization was conceived following the meeting of the first session of the ad hoc committee on tuberculosis epidemic held in london in march 1998 in its inaugural year itself the stop tb partnership through the amsterdam declaration gave a call for collaborative action for ministerial delegation from 20 countries that bear the highest burden of tb its secretariat is based at geneva switzerland in 2019 The Stop TB Partnership launched the global plan to end TB 2018-2022. Currently, both the initiatives are working together to eradicate tuberculosis by 2030. Yes, nearly seven years after it was established, the Stop TB Partnership received a formal presence on the board of the Global Fund. The Stop TB Partnership's mandate was to mobilize and organize a diverse group of actors towards the goal of ending TB. The Stop TB Board meets in Varanasi, India this week and will coincide with the World TB Day that is March 24th and this is why this article is much more relevant. Now even though there are so many initiative taken to eradicate TB globally there are three key areas that continue to be underserved. The first is vaccine development, second is newer therapeutic agents for TB and the third is improved diagnostics. See the development of adult TB vaccine is the first area that needs urgent attention. The current vaccine that we use is 100 years old and the development and wide use of adult TB vaccine are essential to completely eradicate TB. In that line, COVID-19 vaccine development process might provide insight for accelerating the vaccine development process. India's capabilities can also play a significant role in vaccine development and vaccine production. This will ensure equitable distribution of the vaccine secondly even though new anti tb drugs are available currently they are few in numbers and face cost and production constraints to combat drug resistance a steady supply of new medication is required so additional resources must be allocated for the development of new anti tb drugs thirdly diagnostics can be improved imagine ye assisted handheld radiology and passive surveillance for cough sounds they can revolutionize tb diagnostics to improve such diagnostics biotechnology startups should be incentivized to disrupt the complexities and price barriers in the current testing mechanisms these three underserved areas are properly served the world can easily achieve the goal of eradicating tb by 2030 so to conclude India's leadership role in the G20 and the upcoming Stop TB partnership which is to be held in Varanasi tomorrow would be a perfect opportunity for India to lead the way in ending TB. Global leaders led by India should make a collective effort to end the menace of TB sooner than later. Only a global collective effort in this regard will help in achieving the dream of eradicating TB. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw two global initiative to end tb after that we saw three underserved areas that need urgent attention to eradicate the menace of tb by 2030 with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article take a look at this text and context article displayed here it talks about the recently released ipcc synthesis report this ipcc synthesis report integrates the findings of three working group reports and three special reports of IPCC released between the years 2018 and 2022 the report marks the culmination of IPCC's sixth assessment cycle that began in the year 2015 the article discusses about some of the important points mentioned in the synthesis report now look at this editorial article this article also deals with the same topic the premise of the article is based on the fact that only a united global effort can help stop the effects of global warming so in our discussion today we will see some of the important points mentioned in both these articles before that i have highlighted the syllabus regarding this discussion you can go through it firstly let us start with the term intergovernmental panel on climate change ipcc is a intergovernmental body of the united nations 
its main objective is advancing scientific knowledge about human induced climate change ipcc was established by the united nation environment program and the world meteorological organization in the year 1988 it prepares comprehensive assessment reports on climate change and special reports on topics agreed to by its member governments till now the ipcc has released six assessment reports the ipcc has three working groups the first working group is related to physical science basis of climate change the second working group is related to impacts adaptation and vulnerability arising out of climate change and the third working group primarily focuses on the area of mitigation of climate change this is all about the basics regarding ipcc now coming to the synthesis report released by ipcc the report highlights the urgent need for drastically reducing the emissions of greenhouse gases the report reveals that the current global temperature increase when compared with the temperature of pre-industrial levels have touched 1.1 degrees celsius if you can remember the paris agreement tries to limit the global temperature increase to 1.5 to 2 degrees celsius the claim of the synthesis report which says that temperature increase has already touched 1.1 degrees celsius is quite scary this means that the window for corrective action to be taken by the global community has been considerably reduced the report also highlights some of the effects of the global temperature increase the impacts will be that of global food insecurity and drinking water shortages the report additionally states that most of these climate change induced changes will disproportionately affect the vulnerable population for example take the case of population present in the islands like one or two maldives tuvalu etc these islands will become uninhabitable in the future because of climate change induced increase in sea level rise and the population living there will be ultimately becoming climate refugees other than these impacts the report also highlights the economic loss and damages incurred due to climate change another important area highlighted by the synthesis report of ipcc is the factor of climate justice when we consider the cumulative or the total co2 emission of different countries across the world across the entire timeline we can see that the western countries have high emissions because of their early industrialization which took place there the concept of climate justice makes note of this particular factor and wants the developed western countries to take a proactive role in helping the developing countries to reduce their emission levels this is all about the impacts of climate change and the concept of climate justice mentioned in the article now coming to the ways in which we can adapt to climate change induced effects the report highlights the need to undertake climate resilient development which will help mitigate the effects of climate change here access to clean energy improving air quality increasing employment opportunity boosting healthcare through technology and delivering equity are among the report's recommended goals to help adapt to climate change okay the report wants additional financial investments to achieve the climate goals these investment if used efficiently will help in creating climate resilient structures which will be useful in reducing the impacts of climate change some of the examples of these funds are the green climate fund and the recently launched loss and damages fund now coming to what india can do to reduce its carbon footprint india can do two things as a developing country india can lower its per capita emissions through energy efficiency policies this includes making the thermal power plants that are fueled by coal more efficient okay secondly over the period of time india can decarbonize the energy sector by shifting to cleaner modes of energy production like solar and wind these are the two things mentioned in the article about the steps that india can take to reduce the carbon footprint of our country with this we have come to the end of the discussion in this discussion first we saw some basic points about ipcc after that we saw the important points mentioned in the ipcc synthesis report after that we saw the concept of climate justice and the steps that the developed countries has to take proactively to address the climate change issue and finally we saw the steps india can take to reduce its carbon footprint 
Now with this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this article here. Yesterday, the chairman of ISRO said that the launch of Chandrayaan-3 and first solar mission Aditya L1 will possibly happen in the mid of 2023. This is about the news. In our discussion today, we will focus on Chandrayaan-3 mission. Chandrayaan-3 is a follow-on mission to Chandrayaan-2 and it is India's third lunar mission. The mission will consist of an indigenous lander module, propulsion module and a rover. Chandrayaan-3 will be launched by LVM-3 or Launch Vehicle Mark 3. Launch Vehicle Mark 3 was earlier called as GSLV Mark 3. Note one important fact here. The mission primarily aims to land a rover on the south pole of the moon. Now coming to the objectives of the mission. There are three main objectives of Chandrayaan-3 mission. Firstly, the mission aims to demonstrate safe and soft landing on the lunar surface. Secondly, the mission aims to demonstrate rover's rowing capability on the moon. And finally, the mission aims to conduct inside to scientific experiments. These are the three main objectives of Chandrayaan-3 mission. Now talking about the payloads. As I said earlier, Chandrayaan-3 mission consists of a lunar module, a propulsion module and a rover. Each of these modules will have their own payloads. Now first, let us talk about the payloads of the propulsion module. The propulsion module will carry the lander and the rover configuration till 100 km lunar orbit. After that, the lander and the rover configuration will get separated from the propulsion module and they will start their journey towards the lunar surface. Apart from this, the propulsion module also has a spectropolarimetry of habited planet Earth, that is the shape payload. This payload will be operated post the separation of the lander module. This payload will help to study the spectral and polarimetric measurements of Earth from the lunar orbit. Okay, This is about the payload that is present in the propulsion module. Now let us move on to the payloads that are present in the lander module. The lander module will have the capability to soft land on the specified lunar site. Once it gets landed, it will deploy the rover on the moon's surface. Apart from the rover, the lander module will consist of four other payloads. Now we will see them one by one. The first payload is Chandra's surface thermophysical experiment. This payload will help to measure the thermal conductivity and the temperature of the lunar site. The second payload is the instrument for lunar seismic activity. It is used for measuring the seismicity around the landing site. And the third payload is the Langmuir probe. This probe will help to estimate the plasma density and its variation at the landing site. And the fourth payload is the passive laser retrorefractive array. This array comes from NASA and it is accommodated for lunar laser ranging studies. These are the four payloads that is present in the lander module. Now coming to the payloads that is present in the rover module. The rover would consist of two payloads. They are the alpha particle X-ray spectrometer and the laser induced breakdown spectroscope. These instruments helps to derive the elemental composition in the vicinity that is near the landing site. So these payloads will help us understand the chemical and the molecular composition of the material that is found near the landing site. Apart from this, the rover will carry out in situ chemical analysis of the lunar surface during the course of its mobility in the lunar surface. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw all the basic points regarding the Chandrayaan-3 mission. We saw the three modules present in the mission and we also saw the payloads present in each modules. So with this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. A look at this article. It says that Bhagat Singh is less celebrated in the history of India. In this discussion, we will not get into the details of the article. Rather, we will try to understand the role of Bhagat Singh in our freedom struggle. Bhagat Singh was born in a Sikh family in Banga village of Faisalaba district on 27th September 1907. Today, this village is in Pakistan's Punjab province. As his family was deeply inspired by nationalism, he too became actively involved in the country's freedom movement. At the age of 13, he quit education and got admitted into the National College in Lahore. Here he studied European Revolutionary Movement. Later, when his parents tried to get him married, 
Bhagat Singh obviously left home and went to Kanpur. In 1926, Bhagat Singh established the Youth Society of India and later he joined the Hindustan Republican Association. And Hindustan Republican Association was later renamed as Hindustan Socialist Republican Association. During that time, he met many anti-colonial activists. As a teenager, Bhagat Singh popularized the slogan of Inkilab Zindabad, that is, Long Live the Revolution. This slogan eventually became the catchphrase for the Indian independence movement. Then on 30th October 1928, the Simon Commission visited Lahore. One of the greatest Indian leaders who was popularly known as Punjab Kesari, that is Lala Lajpat Rai, led a silent march in protest against the commission. He led the silent march in protest against the commission because the Simon Commission did not have even a single Indian member. Even though it was a silent protest, Lala Lajpat Rai was subjected to brutal lathi charge by the superintendent of police, James Scott. Even after being assaulted, Rai said to the crowd, I declare the blow struck on me today will be the last nails in the coffin of British rule in India. Later, Lajpat Rai died of heart attack in 17th November 1928 in Lahore. It is believed that Lajpat Rai never fully recovered from the blows received at the hands of Scott. This incident outraged young Bhagat Singh. It also outraged Sukhdev and Rajguru. So they plotted to assassinate the superintendent of police James Scott in Lahore. However, in a case of mistaken identity, John Saunders, the assistant superintendent of police was shot. Bhagat Singh escaped from Lahore to Calcutta after the incident. This incident famously led to the Lahore conspiracy case. Later, Bhagat Singh and Bhattikeshwar Dutt threw a bomb in the Central Legislative Assembly on 8th April 1929. It was to protest against the passage of Public Safety Bill and the Trade Disputes Bill. These bills were aimed at curtailing the civil liberties of citizens in general and workers in particular. The bombs had been deliberately made harmless and were aimed at making the deaf hear, that is the British government hear. The objective was to get arrested and use the trial court as a forum for propaganda so that people would become familiar with their movement and their ideology. As per the plan, he was arrested after the incident. Then Bhagat Singh, Sukhdev and Rajguru were tried for the Lahore conspiracy case. Many other revolutionaries were tried in a series of other cases and finally on 23rd March 1931, Bhagat Singh, Sukhdev and Rajguru were hanged. Here know that every year March 23 is observed as a Martyr's Day as a tribute to the freedom fighters Bhagat Singh, Sukhdev and Rajguru. Another important point before we conclude the discussion, Why I am an Atheist is a popular essay written by Bhagat Singh. That's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw the role of Bhagat Singh in India's freedom movement. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Have a look at this article. It talks about the recent controversy relating to the origin of COVID-19 virus. There has been two different stories about the origin of the COVID-19 virus. One is that COVID-19 emerged as a result of human error in a Chinese lab, while the other one claims that it emerged as a result of natural transmission from wildlife to humans. Recently, a group of scientists published a report in a magazine called The Atlantic saying that the cause of COVID-19 was natural. This report was based on a data uploaded on the data portal called GISEID, but recently GISEID has removed the particular data based on which the scientists published their finding in the magazine Atlantic. GISEID said that the data has been taken down from their database because they were revising it. This is what is given in this article. In this context, let us learn about GISEID in prelims perspective. GISEID is expanded as Global Initiative on Sharing Avian Influenza Data. It is a global science initiative established in the year 2008. It provides open access to genomic data of influenza viruses and coronaviruses responsible for COVID-19 pandemic. Here note that the official host of the GISEID platform is the country of Germany. The database platform operates through a model of public-private partnership. The database includes genetic sequences and related clinical and epidemiological data related with 
human viruses. The GAACID initiative provides free of charge access to their database to all the individuals who have agreed to uphold the GAACID sharing mechanism governed through its data access agreement. It also actively promotes the development of novel research tools for the analysis of influencer data. It also helps individuals to facilitate the integration of their tools to analyze GISAID data. This is all regarding GISAID, that is Global Initiative on Sharing of Avian Influencer Data. With this, we have come to the end of the discussion. In this discussion, we discussed about GISAID in prelims perspective. Now, let us conclude the news article discussion session and take up the practice prelims questions. We have four practice prelims questions today. Let us see them one by one. Let us take up the first question. This question is in regards to Abel Price. Today, an article about Abel Price has appeared in the Hindu newspaper in page number 15 of Chennai edition. This is why I framed this question regarding Abel Price. It is a three statement question. Here notice that they have asked us to find the incorrect statements. Okay. Now let us take up the first statement. The Apple Prize is awarded every four years to outstanding international mathematicians. This statement is wrong because the Apple Prize is awarded annually to outstanding international mathematicians and not every four years. There is another one medal awarded to outstanding mathematicians. It is called the Fields Medal. This medal awarded every four years on the occasion of International Congress of Mathematicians. This Fields Medal is awarded to one or more mathematicians under the age of 40. This is to recognize outstanding mathematical achievement for existing work and for the promise of future achievement. So statement one is wrong. Moving on to the second statement. The prize is awarded by the Norwegian government. This statement is actually correct. The Abel Prize is awarded annually by the Norwegian government. It was established by the Norwegian government in 2002 and the Abel Prize is unofficially called the Nobel Prize for Mathematics. The prize is managed by the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters. Now coming to the Fields Medal. It is awarded by the International Mathematical Union, which is an international non-governmental and non-profit scientific organization. Okay, so statement 2 is correct. Moving on to the third statement. For 2023, Abel Prize was awarded to American mathematician Dennis Farnell Sullivan. Actually, this statement is wrong. Mr. Dennis Farnell Sullivan was awarded Abel Prize for the year 2022. For the year 2023, the recipient of the Abel Prize was the Argentinian American Louis Caffarelli. Mr. Louis Caffarelli is a professor at the University of Texas and he is the first Latin American mathematician to receive the award. This award was provided for his work on the partial differential equations and this partial differential equations is used in a variety of applications from analyzing water flow to analyzing population growth. So statement 3 is wrong. With this, we will also see the recipients of Fields Medal for the year 2022. Actually, for the year 2022, there were four Fields Medal recipients. They were Hugo Duminel Copain, June Hou, James Minard, and Mariana Walzowska. So, these four are the four recipients of the recently announced Fields Medal. See, in this question, as I already mentioned, they have asked for the incorrect statements. Here, statement 1 and statement 3 are incorrect. So the correct answer here is option C, 1 and 3 only. Moving on to the second question. This question is about the Chandrayaan 3 mission. Three statements are given. Here also they have asked us to find the incorrect statements. Let us take up the first statement. This mission is launched by GSLV Mark 2. This statement is incorrect because from our discussion we saw that Chandrayaan 3 mission will be launched by the LVM3 or launch vehicle Mark 3. Okay. Moving on to the second statement. The primary objective of the mission is to demonstrate safe and soft landing on the lunar surface. This statement is correct. The main objective is to demonstrate safe and soft landing on the lunar surface. Moving on to the third statement. The mission aims to land a rover on the north pole of the moon. See this statement is wrong because the mission aims to land the rover on the southern pole of the moon. So statement 3 is incorrect. Since they have asked for the incorrect statements. Here the correct answer is option C, 1 and 3 only. Moving on to the third question. This is a previous year question which appeared in the 2018 prelims paper. Let me read to the question. He wrote biographies of Mazzini, Giribaldi, Shivaji and Sri Krishna 
stayed in America for some time and was also elected to the Central Assembly. The correct answer here is Lala Lajpat Rai, who is also called Punjab Kesari. So, the correct answer here is option C. Moving on to the last question. This question is the quiz question for you. Go through the question and try to answer the question and post the answers in the comment section. The main questions based on today's discussion are displayed here. Interested aspirants can write the answers for these questions and post them in the comment section. If you like today's discussion, like, comment and share it with your friends. For more updates regarding UPSC preparation, subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy's YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.